I'm happy to call our second speaker on the proposition side of the motion, Isaac Fung. Isaac is a first... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Isaac is a first-year student reading history at Emmanuel College. He won this slot through open audition. Isaac, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming this evening to hear this debate today. This is a topic which is very personal to me. I am from Hong Kong. I've been to many protests, as some of you would know. And like Victor talked a lot about China being a benign power, a power which simply wants to reclaim its rightful place in the world, peacefully, amiably, talking with the British Empire, or what is now the British government, working together for a prosperous future of Hong Kong, democracy, human rights, the whole package. I wish your words were there to comfort that girl on the 14th of July, when she was crawled up in fetal position, crying for mummy. Mummy, where are you, mummy? As the police stormed in to Newtown Plaza, which is where I live, I saw scenes of hand-to-hand -hand combat in my home with the police employing pepper spray and batons against protesters who had nothing more than umbrellas and face masks. That is the reality of Hong Kong today. But I'm here today not only to prove that China is a brutal, authoritarian power which completely neglects human rights and any pretense of democracy. I'm here to show that it is indeed a new model of imperialism which goes to the very heart of the Hong Kong identity and vitiates the very sense of importance that Hong Kong people hold today. So what do I define by imperialism? It is a policy, practice or advocacy of extending the power and dominion of a nation over the political or economic life of other areas. So what is China doing right now? We can look at the history of the Communist Party in its treatment of Hong Kong. What the Chinese Communist Party has essentially done is that it has subjected my native city and my people to an extended campaign of de facto colonial and imperial subjugation aimed uh, eradicating the Hong Kong identity which prizes liberal democracy, which prizes internationalism, which prizes Cantonese and English as the spoken languages of that city. That is what China is doing. If we look at the public opinion program at the University of Hong Kong, 53% of all Hong Kongers no longer identify as China in response to the perceived and new threat of imperialism which China poses. Among 18 to 29 year olds, 90% of people would rather call themselves Hong Kongers than Chinese in a direct protest against the imperial power opposed by China today. Let's talk about this new history of imperialism. Hong Kong never really had a say in its own identity. It was first the plaything of the British Empire, and it was tossed like a scrap from one dying empire to one new empire to the Chinese. There was no Hong Kong delegation to the Sino-British negotiations when the Joint Declaration was signed. True, the Joint Declaration at the time had widespread support, but nevertheless, Hong Kong did not have a say. It was Britain, it was the Chinese, two empires talking to each other without consultation to the Hong Kong people. Following that, 2003, um, our Secretary of Security attempted to pass Article 23. This is a new proposition which was not yet on the British statute books. It was, in, it, was, it was tried to be introduced by China and it talked about the secession, sedition, subversion against the central people's government. Note, it is not against the Chinese people. It is against the central people's government. The people's government which was established by Mao Zedong right, really not that far ago. We should reject any notions of continuity to a larger kind of 2,000 year old Qing and Ming dynasty culture. We should look at the Communist Party as it is, a new phenomenon. Half a million people in 2003 marched against that law of subversion. Half a million people walked for freedom. 2012, the moral and national education again rammed down the Hong Kong, like the throats of the Hong Kong people by the government at the direct request of the Communist Party. And they wanted them to teach a curriculum where the Communist Party was seen as an advanced, selfless, and united ruling group. This was to be taught to primary school children. Again, clear efforts at imperialism, clear efforts at shaping the Hong Kong identity where otherwise none would have existed. 2014, something which Joshua Wong will hopefully talk about again, the Umbrella Revolution, efforts at democratic reform, a 79-day sit-in squashed. 
and most recently in 2019, the protests. You have one million people marching against the extradition bill, which, which, which would have destroyed the firewall between Hong Kong and China's legal systems. Then you had two million people. Then it escalated into nine months of protests. You've got the siege of universities. You've got the police storming into train stations, into neighborhoods, into shopping malls, as part of a de facto occupying force on behalf of China. So this is clearly imperialism. This is clearly Hong Kong being subjected to a brutal campaign both uh, with soft measures and harsh measures in order to force it into compliance, in order to force it into obedience. So why is this new? Surely China is simply reasserting its former sovereignty over Hong Kong. Surely it is just part of a continu continuation of 2,000 years of an illustrious Chinese history. Now we must understand that the ideological impetus of the Communist Party of China is completely and utterly new. The Qing Dynasty saw itself as, you know, the center of the world. It saw itself as kind of the middle of the world. It didn't need to care about other people. But what the Communist Party of China does is that it offers a direct and competing alternative to Western liberal democracy. It is a direct and existential threat, not only to the West, but to the very way of life which has been enshrined in Hong Kong as a matter of fact, as a matter of identity. It is new and it is imperial. I could go on and talk about the culture which is destroyed in the name of economic progress by China. We've got the degradation of Hong Kong from something where, a city can, where the people of a city can decide their own futures of high autonomy promised under the basic law to basically a glorified shopping mall, a shipping post for the, for the further glorification of China. You've got the National People's Congress asserting, using Article 158 of the Basic Law, that they have the ultimate power of interpretation of the Constitution, and they've used this in order to, to expressly disqualify Hong Kong democratic um, lawmakers. They have declared that the Sino-British Declaration, which promises Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy, as a historical document, one which they can, which they can neglect. So when, when China goes to the world and, say, and says to the world that we love democracy, we love human rights, this is sophistry at its highest level. I have seen what the human rights and democracy of China is. I want no part of it. How am I doing for time? Oh, Lovely. Um, <laughs> what we've seen is in Hong Kong, a proxies and collaborators working with the central Chinese government. You've got the pro-establishment camp, a coterie, frankly, of quislings and cronies elected and chosen by the Communist Party. You've got 35 out of 70 uh, legislators in LegCo, which is our version of parliament, being chosen by functional constituency, and pretty much all of those functional constituencies are packed with pro-Beijing sympathizers. So let's think about all of this. We have a Hong Kong which has been subjugated in both, both uh, with like laws, with incentive, economic incentives, to force it into the fold of China. We've got a harsh and brutal campaign of nine months of China waging war against its own people, sending the police against its own people, trying to eradicate the very languages and the very cultures which makes Hong Kong distinctive and special in the first place. We, have, we also see that this imperialism is, an, is one of an entirely new character. It is a character which is expressly against liberal democracy succeeding in Hong Kong. If Hong Kong succeeds as a liberal democracy, that is an existential threat to the centralized model of control which Xi Jinping so desperately wants the world to follow, or at least to acknowledge that China has over its world. What we have is a very simple choice, and what the Cambridge Union needs to do as a body is look at what is happening to Hong Kong as kind of the canary in the coal mine, what is going to happen to the rest of the world. You have seen the police willingly besiege their own universities, trapping their people inside. You have seen them beating um, basically 14, 15-year-old um, adolescents who dare go out on the streets. There are uh, alleged reports of gang rape perpetrated in police stations. You've got Carrie Lam, completely useless, completely unsure of what to do, waiting for orders from the liaison office, waiting for orders from Xi Jinping, waiting for, all of, waiting for China to tell her what to do so that she can maintain her pretense of a legitimate government, so that she can continue her colonial policies, so that she can continue to act against the interests of the people of Hong Kong, so that she may appease her masters in Beijing. This is the reality which we face today. So let me sum up, because I think I only have a minute left. This is imperialism on an unprecedented scale. 
Don't let anyone who tries to tell you that China is, you know, you know, like just as good as the British Empire, or really just the same as the West, or just reasserting its old prerogatives of sovereignty. This is entirely new. This is a program by the Communist Party against the identity of the Hong Kong people, against democracy, against freedom. I urge all of you to vote for the motion, regardless of what your previous sympathies may have been. We can see here it is tyranny, it is oppression, and we, might, and we must fight against it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech, Isaac.